The Teflologists have written a book, Podcasting and Professional Development, a guide for English language teachers, details the emergence of the podcast as a tool for professional development, engagement, and personal investment, as well as providing a guide to setting up your own podcast. Featuring a foreword by Thomas Farrell, this is the first book written for language teachers hoping to make connections between the podcasting medium and their own professional development. Podcasting and Professional Development, a guide for English language teachers, is released by the independent publishing collective The Round, which has produced e-books by Scott Thornbury, Nikki Hockley, Lindsay Clanfield, and many others. For a full list of titles, visit theround.com. Podcasting and Professional Development, a guide for English language teachers, is available on The Round and directly through Amazon, and all profits from sales will go back into producing the Tephalology podcast. Pick up a copy and support the show. Is there any relevance of native speaker norms? That's a question for Tephalologists. Is it better to focus on form or to focus on forms? That's a question for Tephalologists. If you use a textbook, is your classroom authentic? Or should your approach be more learner-centric? From feedback to learner autonomy, we'll discuss it all on Tephalology. Hi, I'm Matthew. I'm Rob. And I'm Matt. And welcome back to the Tephalology Podcast podcast about teaching English as a foreign language and related matters, presented by three self-certified Tephalologists. Tefl Cultures. Okay, so for this week's Tefl Culture, I'd like to talk about exploratory practice. I, my, I used to teach some adult learners at the British Council, and um, I told them that I had this podcast, and they were like, oh, we'd like to listen to it. And I was like, oh, it's not really for you. I don't think you'll get it. They were like, oh, it doesn't matter. We're, we're interested in, uh, in, you know, we're interested in what you do. And I was like, oh, okay, yeah, but okay. So I, I guess they could listen to it. I don't know why I'm so hesitant to let them not listen to it. And did yeah. they listen to it? I don't think they have <laughs> yet, but... Um, but I have, the same, I have the same feeling with, you know, family and friends. Yeah, it's not, I'm not, yeah. I'm not making it for them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm making it for a, a very specific audience. And also, the like, a, listening right now. Yeah. yeah. The one person. <laughs> you. <laughs> Simon. Yeah. And, and also, like, um, with the same group of learners, we sort of went out for the after course drinks and we started having conversations about language teaching hmm. with the learners. And it was, it was quite interesting to hear their beliefs of, hmm. from non teaching people. So that's quite interesting. So anyway, so what this kind of leads into, hopefully, is um, exploratory practice, which is kind of what that is, essentially. Um, are you familiar with this term, exploratory practice? Yep. It's, um, it's kind of, we talked about this a few episodes back, where we talked about the teacher-research kind of um, divide, I mm-hmm. guess you called it. And um, what did we talk about there? We talked about to what extent teachers and researchers should be interacting with one another and to what extent they need each other or don't need each other. Mm. Um, yeah, that was, that was the whole crux of the argument. It's still going on. It's obviously an ongoing debate. Um, however, teachers do conduct research or studies themselves. Do you know what this is known as when a teacher conducts research? Action research. Yeah, so Rob said action research. That's uh, one type of... so. Exploratory the, practice? <laughs> the broader term is practitioner research. Okay, so okay, there's, there's like a family of practitioner right, okay. research, of which action research is one. Um, why do teachers do research? I mean, this isn't really the point of what I want to talk about, but I want to talk about it first. To improve their teaching of their students. Yeah, generally, to improve their practice. And I've got here a quote from Prabhu, which I think you're going to talk about later. No. To, okay, <laughs> to improve their, their sense of plausibility. A right. sense of plausibility. A teacher's sense mm. of plausibility, okay. yeah. Right. Well, to, so they feel, like, they feel like what they're doing in the classroom has some purpose or... Uh, yeah, I think so. And it's, it's kind of of low... And uh, Prabhu talks, maybe Rob will talk about this later, this idea no. of no best method anymore and more kind of localised kind of non-generalisable, not using non-generalisable research, but 
being a bit more pl- plausible in your local sort of teaching mm. context. Well, the post method kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I guess something that ties in with that, and I've already said it five times, is exploratory practice, which I'm now going to talk about after all that. Done. Okay. <laughs> and uh, this section's finished. Um, uh, exploratory practice um, kind of took hold actually in the early 1990s, although I've, I've only sort of recently started hearing about it again. So I think it's had a bit of a resurgence, which I'll talk about. Do you know who started uh, exploratory practice, or EP, I'm going to say from now on? Nope. It was a, a one Dick Allwright. Uh, right. So, yeah. <laughs> what, why did you put the one? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know why I said that. Oh, one Dick Allwright, <laughs> two Dicks, weird. It was a... Three Dicks, <laughs> all right. So... Yeah, so I don't know why I said that. Okay. And he started this along with teachers, language teachers and educators working in Brazil. Mm. And I believe that uh, EP is still quite popular in Brazil to this day. It's interesting. I often used to get Dick Allwright and Dick Schmidt last uh, week's Pioneer mixed up. Yeah, yeah. Well, it was as, as you were talking about it last mm. week as well, What the kind of work that Schmidt did in that article that you mm. talked about was kind of exploratory in this sense. You know, he was acting mm-hmm. as a learner. Yep. And I'll, we'll come on to that a bit yeah, later yeah. on, maybe. But um, So it came about because they were seeking to understand what was going on in their classrooms through integrating language, learning, and teaching with research itself. And also as a way to address the feeling of burnout that came about from the pressures of needing to teach and research. Mm. Uh, that's uh, that was quite interesting because I don't think a lot of people have burnout for those reasons, but mm. according to these teachers, that was one of the causes of burnout. They needed research and teaching time. Right, but they needed to do research and yeah. teaching time. Yeah, yeah, weird. Yeah, I, I mean, yeah. I've yeah. never had to do that. Yeah, that struck me as weird too. But yeah, um, so this is what EP is. It's a form of practitioner research in which learners and teachers are encouraged to investigate their own teaching learning practices in which teachers and learners simultaneously develop their own understanding of what they're doing as learners and teachers. Mm. Um, It's a form of practitioner research, like we talked about before, alongside action research, reflective practice, classroom research, and narrative inquiry. Mm. But there's a crucial difference, which I'll talk about later. Um, EP emphasizes collegial networks that work primarily towards understanding rather than problem-solving, Involve yeah. everybody cooperatively, brings everyone together, and integrates inquiry and pedagogy. This includes seeing learners as co-researchers. Mm. Oh. Okay, so that's pretty radical, I think, like using your learners as co-researchers. Maybe we'll talk about that later on. Yeah. Um, mm. EP also serves as a way to blur distinctions and boundaries between researchers and practice, and it also attempts to generate public engagement. And this term public, I guess this means the learners are the public. They're kind of outside of what you just assume would be the profession, the ELT professional. Mm-hmm. So it's therefore making research public. And I guess depending on the age of the learners, maybe their their parents as well would kind of be involved in this too, perhaps. Mm-hmm. So I think that's what public means in this sense. Um, the reason why this has kind of come back around or got a bit more popularity recently, is uh, Judith Hanks's book, recently authored book, titled Exploratory Practice in Language Teaching, in which she expands on and theorises the approach and provides different EP case studies to describe and explain what it is. All right. Yes. So you're probably wondering, or not, um, how do you actually do EP? How do, how do you think you'd, you'd go about doing an EP project? Uh, I mean, you, you talked about... They describe it as understanding rather than problem solving. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> so I guess the first thing is identify an area that you want to understand better. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, an, an area of another teacher's professional practice, do you mean? Something like that? Uh, another, another aspect of your classroom? Or? I mean, the, the sense I get is that it's focused more on, on what you do as a practitioner, so mm-hmm. what's happening in your classroom. Right, so it's in your <laughs> classroom. I guess. I, I suppose it could be another classroom i'm not sure so yeah so ep doesn't have a change or improvement agenda (coughs) in mind necessarily Uh it puts understanding before problem solving and unlike other approaches like action research it emphasizes being puzzled or puzzling about Mm. so anyone wishing to start ep should start about with the notion of puzzlement 
Um, right. A further quote from Breen. Who? What's Breen's first name? Is it Gary Mike, Breen? Mike Breen? Gary Breen. No, he's a football player. Michael Breen. Michael Breen. No, Kevin Breen. Michael Breen. Okay. Another quote by Breen, 2016, is that it replaces a preoccupation with effectiveness, with a focus on teachers' quality of life and professional well-being, through cooperative understanding of everyday puzzles. Mm. Hmm. So, very briefly, steps in EP could include starting with a puzzling question before refining and sharing this question or questions with your learners. Can you give an example of a puzzling question? I'm going to come on to that. Okay. Yeah. And then later on, the moments of transition could be observed, for example, through narrative analysis. And then from what I can tell, and I think the framework is still, it's kind of a loose framework. Uh, it's more of an ethos, I, I think, with this kind of thing, is that... Um, we, after we've kind of puzzled with our learners, we then need to step back and look at the problem or puzzle from a different lens or a different perspective. So we'd consult research or consult other parties around the puzzle kind of thing. Rob, you asked for an example. So Hanks gives the example of an EAP teacher, an English for Academic Purpose teacher um, named Bella. She uses this kind of vignette throughout the book. And her question was, why do learners find English dif spelling difficult? Mm. So she said, rather than look for solutions or think about the how to improve spelling, uh, Bella asked her initial question to her students and to other teachers. She then found that the students and the other teachers took an interest in this puzzle and collaborative collaboratively helped to explore it. Mm. So, so yeah. you said it's not about problem solving, but that, to me, sounds like just indirect problem solving. Like, why, why are they interested in why spelling's difficult? Because well, it's a problem. Yeah. So <coughs> they are trying to solve a problem. This right? is kind of... That's, yeah. So that's a question. But I, I wonder if, yeah. if the... I, I was thinking the same thing as you, but I wonder if the indirectness is an important part of it, mm -hmm. where the approach you take to it is not that I'm going to solve the problem, but just that I'm going to understand it better. Right. And that the solving of the problem might be a byproduct, or you may end up solving a different problem. That you mm. weren't aware you had. No, I suppose. I think it's more nuanced than simply trying to research that question or get like. So what I've written here, in my own words, you're inquiring with learners rather than about or on them. Does, mm. that, does that make sense? So you're not you're not studying them and you're not yeah. getting data from them. Is, you're working with them. Is basically. the idea maybe not maybe just an incidental kind of benefit or or outcome of this that it's it's also. I mean, it sounds almost like it could be a teaching approach. Yeah, I think it is, yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. And in some of the other case studies, it, it literally just documents something that the teacher tried in the class mm. and then reflected upon it. Mm. Right. But also asked the learners what they thought of it as well. And I think also letting them know that you are trying to find out something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think, yeah. How, how much do you think learners would appreciate that? Yeah, like being yeah. brought in because I, I don't know how much I'd enjoy being brought into the process. So I, I, I kind I, of yeah. want like I'm here to be taught, not to engage in your you know kind of thing. I think not yeah, to say that it's not valuable. Yeah. I'm sure learners would. Uh, there are learners who would be interested in that, but yeah, do you think all? Yeah, learners I think would be? I think the term co-researcher is like problematic. But I mean, it goes back to my earlier argument. Like, why why shouldn't we be sharing what we're doing professionally with our learners? Hmm. Or why should we? Or why should we? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Let's ask that too. I, I don't know, because I think, like, it seems like we should be kind of being a bit more open with and transparent with our learners. But I think um, that assumes that the learners care. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't think that... I mean, like, I, my the learners... learners have a very specific goal in our classroom. Right. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think it, it depends on the context. <laughs> like, so a lot of studies have been... have used EP with EAP... Um, annoyingly, um, EAP studies. So these are students that are studying English for academic purposes anyway. So maybe that has something to do with it, perhaps. Maybe they're older students as well. Possibly. I mean, I, I think some some students, as I say, I think some students would enjoy this um, and get into it. Mm. But I don't know if all students would. Um, and I, I think... Like, I, I like the idea of students being involved in the process, of students being involved in the research process yeah, and all that yeah. kind of thing. But I also think that there's, um, I don't know, you have to be very careful in assuming that the students are going to care about what you care about. Like, for a lot of students, language study isn't even that important. You know, they're doing it because they have to. They've got another goal in mind. Yeah. 
And so for them, if you, if you start telling them all about your professional stuff and I'm doing this project and I want you to be involved in this project, yeah. they're going to think, oh, I don't care. <laughs> and even the ones who, who do care about being in the class, they want to improve their language skills. Right, right. That's their, their main goal. Yeah. Mm. Uh, some of the case studies, there's one particular example in there where um, the, what we have in Japan, zemis, mm. which are... Rob, do you have a Zemi? Can you explain what that is? Well, they're seminars. I mean, like in Japanese universities, they tend to have this mentoring relationship where each uh, faculty member has a small number of students that they meet with once a week. And it's it's like a course, but you're meant to take more of a mentoring role in their life, you know, so you yeah, kind of, yeah. Yeah, you give them more personalised advice. That kind of so thing. there's a case study in that book where they talk about that very relationship and mm-hmm. how EP is, was used in a Zemi group, mm-hmm. basically. So I think that it could work in that area as well. Yeah, yeah. Interestingly, um, Craig Smith, who was our first interviewee, he's, mm. he's written at least one article on exploratory practice as far back as 2009. Mm-hmm. And um, thinking back as well, he, you know the model United Nations? Yeah. I think that could relate to this as well, because mm-hmm. you're having students conducting these kind of, you know, what's it called, mock, mock discussions, mm-hmm. but they're probably being supported by experts as well mm. so they're all kind of working together mm. so that's yeah. kind of a form of EP um, what's unfortunate is that these articles are often written up as book chapters or, or articles so that kind of defeats the object of doing this in the first place it kind of takes it back away from the public mm. and puts it into the academic sphere so that's kind of contradictory I yeah think, so. that's, that's the other thing is that this kind of research is meant to be is it emic versus etic like yeah. emic is yeah, for it's the emic, research it's inside yeah. Yeah. yeah so but it's, it seems to me that when I look at this kind of research a lot of it is produced in a very performative way mm-hmm. like the idea is it's meant to be teachers doing things for their own practice but it seems mostly to be done by researchers in order to show but then those are just the ones that are available to me. But I don't, I don't know yeah, any teachers yeah. that actually do this without planning to publish it as an article in the end. Mm. There's, there's some... Yeah. No, but maybe we don't know because they don't uh, talk about it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> there are kind of some hybrid versions out there. For example, there's exploratory action research, which I think uh, Richard Smith is mm. involved with. And yeah. um, this involves teachers not producing articles at the end of their action research, but they kind of produce these big kind of interactive posters. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's the only way, that, well, not the only way, but that's the main way of getting their research across is through these kind of posters. Mm-hmm. Um, um, yeah, maybe we'll, that's a free article, that's a free book as well that's made available through the, the British, British Council. Council yeah. yeah, so I mean, that's, that's one option to make these books open, openly accessible. Mm-hmm. Okay, so yeah, that's today's TEFL Culture, uh, Exploratory Practice. TEFL Pioneers. This episode's TEFL Pioneer is N.S. Prabhu. Have you heard of him? We just talked about him. <laughs> oh yeah, that's true. <laughs> um, <laughs> I always thought we'd have you heard of him. Uh, so yeah. what do you know about him? Apart from exploratory practice stuff. <laughs> well, I mean, he's not really related to exploratory practice, right? But I know that he wrote an article in, like, the year 2000 saying that there's no best method. All right. Well, we're going to be focusing um, on a project that he was involved with um, called the Bangalore Project. Is that something mm-hmm. that you're familiar with? Not familiar. No. You, you've, you've heard of yeah, it. Yeah, I've heard of it. Yeah. Wasn't, he, wasn't there a f- former pioneer that we've talked about who worked on that? I can't remember who. Mm. I don't think so. Not, not that particular one. But um, anyway, well, okay. well, we'll get into okay. it. Um, so we're actually going to be talking more about the project than about Prabhu himself. Um, but we're going to be talking a little bit about his interests and maybe how his interests influenced the development of the project. Um, so in an interview with Alan Mailey, which was published in the Teacher Trainer Journal, um, Prabhu uh, says that he was very influenced by two books as a, as a youngster. <laughs> One of them was Harold Palmer's Principles of Language Study, Mm -hmm. uh, maybe Scientific Principles of Language Study, Mm -hmm. Um, and the second one was Chomsky's Syntactic Structures. Now, if someone's been very influenced by those two books, what what do you imagine their views of language teaching might look like? Um, Quite Mm form-focused, or forms-focused. Okay, interesting. Why why do you say that? I mean, uh, maybe interested in looking at the, the mechanics of you know, syntax, basically. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. You mean the same thing? Yeah. <laughs> okay, interesting. Well, we'll see. Um, so he actually said, 
in a way, I've been trying to make sense of language teaching in a way that is in harmony with those two views, right? Okay. So the views of Palmer and Chomsky. Um, so he worked as uh, an English language officer uh, of the British Council in Madras, uh, and later at the National University of Singapore, uh, and he retired from there in 1994, so quite a long time ago. Um, and as I said, he's most famous for his work on the Bangalore Project, which ran from 1979 to 1984. So, uh, the Bangalore Project was called that because of its connection to the Regional Institute of English, uh, in, which is in Bangalore, um, but officially the title was the Communicational Teaching Project, or CTP. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, for a long time, India had been using uh, an approach to language teaching known as SOS. What do you mm. think that stands for? Speak? Say? <laughs> no. Sounds? No. <laughs> Speech? No. SOS just means help, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> it meant, it stood for uh, structural oral situational, mm. right? Okay. So it was very similar to the, uh, you know, the, the structural approach, which was uh, sort of the precursor of audiolingualism, mm. and that kind of thing. Uh, it featured a lot of drilling, mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, and it was similar to situational language teaching, which they had in the UK. Um, but... Uh, it wasn't considered to be very successful. So a lot of teachers found that even with all of this extensive drilling, the students weren't acquiring the habits that they thought that they should be acquiring. Mm. Um, and so because of that, uh, it was in, in an attempt to tackle that, that the communicative or communicational teaching project was conceived of. Um, and it began in 1979 under the direction of Prabhu and Esther Romani. Uh, and the assumption that it was based on, so this is an, a very important point, the assumption it was based on was that form is best learnt when the learner's attention is on meaning. Mm -hmm. Right? So what, what, what does that remind you of, <clears throat> that, that little uh, sentence? Um, I guess a, like a, a focus on form approach. Okay. Form... Not forms. But a focus no. on form. form is best learnt when the learner's attention is on meaning. Right, so... I mean, communicative. Mm -hmm. you, you know, you're not just looking at forms devoid of context. Right, right. You're connecting it to, hopefully, some, some yeah. actual meaning. Well, it's kind of task-based, isn't it, I guess? Right. Yeah. 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 So is, is that that I want to focus on, the, the task-based <coughs> aspect? Um, so Prabhu argued that communicative teaching, up to this point, um, had been training for communication, Whereas his approach that he tried to develop in the Bangalore project was training through communication. Mm -hmm. um, and this was influenced by generativism, so the kind of the Chomsky idea of, of language acquisition, and work in SLA that was going on at that time, the late 1970s, by people such as Krashen, mm. right? Um, and that's a, I mean, through communication rather than for communication, is, mm. that's also CLT. Right, but it's, mm. um, it's acquiring language through the process of communicating rather than acquiring language in that kind of discrete, you know, you, you learn the, the grammar chunk mm -hmm. and then you practice it. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it, the, the process will mm -hmm. lead to the product, if you see what I mean. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so the, the Bangalore project itself was carried out with several groups of students um, over those four years. Uh, I think originally with an all-girls group uh, and then with an all-boys group and then with a mixed group. Um, and in total, uh, there were 365 lessons that were tried out. Mm -hmm. um, and it was... As you, as you mentioned, uh, an early experiment in task-based teaching. Or actually, Michael Long, in his recent book, uh, has said it was more like task-supported teaching. Mm -hmm. um, and the way that the project was organised was as a series of problems which the learners had to solve, utilising their language skills. Um, so there were three broad types of tasks that were used. There were information gap tasks, reasoning gap tasks, and opinion gap tasks. Right. So sometimes they were trying to transfer information from one medium to another, and sometimes they were trying to give their opinion on, on something that was going on. Mm -hmm. um, the lessons usually began with a pre-task activity, which was fronted by the teacher, and it was a kind of a whole class thing, um, and then moved on to the actual task, which was usually individual. Hmm. Yeah. Individual? You mean with, with the teacher? No, it was just the student doing the task by themselves. Oh, oh. Written? <laughs> yeah, presumably. <laughs> speaking yeah. to themselves. So. Yeah, well, so, so uh, I wasn't completely clear on this in, in my research, but uh, mm. this was one of the criticisms was that there wasn't enough group work. Mm. So I guess it would be, kind of, there, there must have been some speaking involved, but I guess it would be teacher, student, maybe they do the task and they do feedback, that mm. kind of thing. Um, 
so the uh, the tasks involved things like timetables, uh, sets of rules, maps, you know, mm -hmm. um, and it was very materials light. Uh, mm -hmm. So they usually just had like a, a pencil, paper, and chalkboard. This is in you know overcrowded kind of Indian classrooms in the nineteen eighties. So mm -hmm. yeah, not a lot in the way of resources. Mm -hmm. um, and feedback in the tasks was focused on task completion. So the feedback the teacher gave was all about how well the students had completed the task, not about their language. Mm. The only mm. feedback they got in their language was really clarifications. Yeah. Mm. So, I mean, how does this sound as a, you know, as just an idea? This is the first, <coughs> kind of, the first time that this kind of approach was experimented with. And what do you think about it? Mm. It sounds interesting. I mean, it, the, yeah, it maybe connects a bit to the, like an output hypothesis. Mm -hmm. um, this idea of, you know, just them using the language to complete this task therefore presumably producing some kind of language, although maybe not if they're doing it on their own, right, right. Um, is, is a means to acquiring the language. Yeah, so um, this approach, Prabhu's idea, was a little bit less radical than Krashen, because Krashen basically said, all you need is input, I think that's his famous quote, right? Yeah. Um, and, and Prabhu said, well, you, you, you know, we'll get the input at the start, and then it's, all, and then it's based on output. It's based on your know, using mm -hmm. the reasoning to do something with the language. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm. um, and actually, he said that for Indians, I think it's quite kind of a questionable idea, but for Indians, learning the language or the English language was about reasoning, not about you know, personal use of the language. You know, it was like a logical thing. Okay. Strange. Do you think he meant that about English specifically or about language learning in general? About English specifically, mm -hmm. I think. And that, actually that was one reason that people had rejected the earlier SOS method because um, it uh, had like... Um, uh, sorry, sorry, not the SOS, the, the method they were using before that, which was British influence, it had lots of literature and cultural stuff, and they mm -hmm. got rid of all that because they thought it's not relevant, you just need it. For yeah, I wanted to ask, why why was SOS replaced? You, you might have said, like someone said it wasn't working. It wasn't working, basically, you, I mean, yeah. In what sense wasn't it working? In that the students weren't learning the language they were being taught. Like yeah. They weren't forming the habits through the drilling that they were okay. being taught. So, um, so... That was the, the kind of the, the, the general shape of the project. Um, it ran for several years. Um, there was some criticism of it. Um, so first of all, it was called like the Bangalore project. Sometimes it was called the Bangalore experiment. It wasn't really an experiment because it wasn't randomized. You know, they didn't have any measurement outcomes. All of the measurement and assessment of the project was done afterwards using like you know just memory and retrospective and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, so it was a bit too haphazard to make any sort of significant claims about effectiveness. Mm. Um, as we mentioned, there were concerns of. Um, mother tongue use uh, of of maybe pigeonization mm. uh, if students are only kind of you know using their output and not being corrected on it. Mm -hmm. um, they there was some criticism that it focused on reasoning at the expense of creativity, mm -hmm. which was again based on this idea of Prabhu's that you know the language should be for for reason and that kind of thing and not for personal expression, mm. um, and that it didn't feature group work, but. It was unique in a lot of different ways. So it was attempting to evaluate a contemporary hypothesis, which was this input, you know, the, the kind of the SLA ideas around at that time. Mm -hmm. um, and it was a relatively small local experiment mm -hmm. um, in an area which was quite deprived in a lot of ways, you know. But the, these were people trying to do something on, uh, you know, it's, it was small, but in that local context, it was quite a big thing. Um, and it was also communicated to a, a wide audience. So they had annual seminars about it. Uh, they published bulletins and newsletters about what was going on. Um, and they had this constant kind of discourse with the public about what was happening and with is this And is this where project. the term snowball comes from? No, no, that in, was... In that it trickled down? or well, the, I can't remember. The Madras snowball was 1960s, so it's like 20 years before. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. Um, it seems like it's snowballing. <laughs> perhaps so, perhaps so. Yeah. Um, but it, it was also... Uh, kind of a natural, a natural setting, right? Um, so it wasn't it wasn't an experiment conceived of in a lab. It was just being done by someone. Um, so yeah, that's some of the criticism. Um, in terms of the actual uh, effectiveness of it, um, there wasn't any official evaluation of the effectiveness. But uh, Beretta and Beretta and Davies, um, two papers. Uh, did some work several years later where they took some of these students and they compared them to people 
like a comparable group of people who weren't engaged in the project. Mm. Um, what would you expect in terms of their uh, their skills at grammar, reading, listening, and then so on? How long after the the project was this done? I think this was around nineteen ninety, so about six years later. Okay. Well, I'd probably say the ones that. <clears throat> maybe you want us to say that um, the ones that didn't do this new new project probably had better better grammar mm-hmm. but far less knowledge of how to go about doing things with that grammar maybe I don't know mm-hmm. or the complete opposite <laughs> <laughs> yeah one of those two yeah no you're, you're pretty you're pretty pretty close so what they found was that um, the students who'd <clears throat> taken part in the uh, the Bangalore project um, did worse on discrete point grammar tests, mm-hmm. um, but they did better on reading and listening. Okay. But they also say that this is not really a, a proper evaluation of the project. Sure, sure. Mm. Um, so, yeah, this this uh, this project it, it was it had a, a huge influence on applied linguistics literature. It's still being referenced. Like in the most recent Mike Long book, there's a whole section, like three or four pages, mm. about the Bangalore project, um, and. Long says that um, the work of Prabhu and Romani, conducted with regular teachers and students in difficult circumstances, often in the face of institutional hostility, deserves to be recognised as one of the most important developments in language teaching in decades. Mm. So it's still, it, it's left a mark, and I think it's, you know, it's, it's an interesting experiment. It's something maybe a, we'd like to see more of mm. a little bit. Um, that kind of, I mean, that still ties with his his later writing as well, mm-hmm. where he was. He seems like he's all about like localized, not testing, but localized approaches to learning. Right, right, right. That are non generalizable, and um, yeah, this is called the the Bangalore project. So it's it's localized. It's a localized account of a change that they made. Yeah, I think that's kind of that is in keeping with his later writing as well. Maybe but I'm mm-hmm. not sure. But yeah, no, I think I think I think you're right. Yeah, I think that um, he had a certain ethos, and I think the project was very influenced by Prabhu's personal, you know, uh, convictions about mm-hmm. how languages should be taught and how they are learned and that kind mm-hmm. of thing. Mm-hmm. And within the within the context of India, yeah. And um, so, if listeners are interested in learning more about this, this is just a very quick sketch. Um, he wrote a book, probably wrote a book describing the project retrospectively. Uh, the book is called Second Language Pedagogy, published by Oxford. Um, there's also a section about it in uh, How It's a History of English Language Teaching. Um, and Christopher Brumfit wrote a report in 1983, so while the project was still going on, which is published in his book Communicative Methodology and Language Teaching mm. from Cambridge. That's actually very interesting because he's kind of evaluating and criticising it while it goes on, and he reports on personal conversations he was having with Prabhu as they were developing the project and that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and as I mentioned, Mike Long also has a section in his uh, new book. Well, it's kind of getting old now. But <laughs> yeah. So um, that was this episode's TEFL Pioneer, MS Prabhu and the Bangalore Project. TEFL News. For this episode's TEFL News, uh, it's, it's, it's definitely news because I found it on a, a newspaper website, mm-hmm. the Daily Mail. Is that a newspaper? Uh, no, it's no longer a valid. Fake news. Fake news, okay. Yeah, I mean, it's a typical Daily Mail headline, which um, I'm not going to read the whole headline, but basically they're expressing surprise that young people, who they call millennials, have their own language. Ah. Yeah, believe it or not, young people have come up with their own slang. That's shocking. Imagine my shock. <laughs> I've I've actually heard I heard someone else talking about this news story as well recently. So okay. Like, yeah. So. All right. So I'm gonna I'm gonna give you some terms. See if you right. uh, can understand. Yeah, what well, they we're mean. we're millennials. Yeah. That's true. Millennials. You guys are millennials. Yeah. Are you, are you so, granddad? No, I'm not a millennial. Are you just you're like one year out? Are you or two years out? I don't know. I've been I've been Gen X even. Yeah, I think you're Gen X. <laughs> but Gen Y? I oh, know. No, Gen millennials. Y is the, the current one. People so the same as millennials. Dependent. But there is a, there's a cut-off point, isn't it? Like no, first Gen years. X, then Gen Y. What's a millennial? No. Millennial is 1982. Three, years. 2000. 2000. Right. And Gen... Well, what, what's the new one, then? Snowflakes? Snowflakes. Well, Snowflakes. <laughs> well there hasn't been a term... Snowflakes. Millennials are snowflakes. There hasn't been a term created yet. We were talking about this the other day. Yeah. Like, we'll have to wait another 15 years for a term to be... Mm. Yeah. Anyway. So the first one I'll give you is... Uh, a is for adulting. Adulting. Yeah. Being an adult, acting like an adult. Yeah, okay, that was an easy one. Benching? Um, is that like a gym term? I'm benching 
20 kilo <laughs> kilograms on that is an actual to be su- are you being pre- substituted in some way yeah kind of I think gen- uh, right, like okay. usually speaking like romantic terms or dating terms like you oh we, we're you benching know. Yeah, or I guess you would you would bench someone if you kind of interested, but you're only going to call them up if you, you know, need oh, a substitute I see, to come I see. in. Okay, yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Not about Pretty going. Not, a, not about going about Congress on a bench. No, definitely okay. not. Congress. <laughs> <laughs> um, Bible. Bible. Mm. It, can you use that in a sentence? Uh, Bible. That dress makes you look fat. And by the intonation is probably off. Is it the same? It just means the holy book of the Christian religion. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. It's, I guess, I don't know, an adverb, but to, 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 sh- to, to show that what you're about to say is, is the truth. Okay. All ah, right, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Makes sense. Like it's Bible. Yeah. 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 Swear to God. Mm-hmm. Okay. Can't even. Ah, I know that. Okay. Can you use it in a sentence? Um, <laughs> ah. <laughs> it's, it's like an expression of. Um, ah, it's hard to explain it. Hmm. Like d- disbelief, but not quite disbelief, right? Yeah, it's like, like, isn't it like I can't even? But you'd use that in a, I, I can't even imagine, begin to imagine how. But that's yeah, yeah, that's. Like that. I read an article true. recently which was called "Yes, You Can Even." It's really. <laughs> like <laughs> it's, yeah, it was because it was people slagging off the the phrase. Yeah, and yeah. What but that was. doesn't strike me as being that's something I've said all my life. Like I can't even begin to imagine. Right. That's a, that's but here the point is, that is different? I can't even stop. Yeah, I can't, I can't yeah. even. All right, good. Yeah. It must come from that, though. It might mm. just be a, mm. Yeah, it's a clip, a clip form. FOMO, yeah. F-O-M-O. <sighs> Somebody is gay over the telephone? <laughs> <laughs> but FOMO, all capitals. So it's an acronym. Oh, right. oh, it's uh, a friend of my, my... This seems like quite useful, actually. This is a fear of missing out. Uh, okay, so, so that, this, okay. this would go with um, uh, your look. I guess, yeah. yeah. So that's like in, so. internet speak, right? That's uh. like chat room speak. Well, they have chat rooms anymore, millennials, do they? Okay, maybe not. We're millennials. <laughs> yeah, you are. Yeah. You're, or your generation snowflake. We, yeah. were, we were born in chat rooms. <laughs> The, the, the new millennials but actually I think uh, Fo- FOMO is already <laughs> <laughs> that's, what that's what they'll be called that's what they'll be called the new ma- the actual millennials right. we're, not, we're not actual millennials we're, we are we're the problem we're, we're cusps we're the, not we're cusps, the millenn- we're cusps all the social issues that affect millennials affect us and therefore we are millennials uh, okay so we have FOMO what about JOMO FOMO is the fear of missing out what's JOMO JOMO is the joy of missing out yes I don't think that's a real. I think that's it's just <laughs> joy of missing out. Is that a, do, do people? I love take, missing out. Do people take joy in missing out on things? Yeah. Have you ever? Have you ever? You know when like someone invites you out and you say, "Oh, I'm really busy." I mean, the, you know, this happens to me occasionally. <laughs> um, and and then you no. sit at home and you're thinking, oh, "I'm glad I didn't go out. This is nice." Yeah. No. You, you see a picture of it on Facebook. And no, I, 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 I would yeah. I would have in, I would have interpreted that as like when you were left out of something, and but then you take joy in kind of showing sadness. In knowing that they, <laughs> when all the people died the in victory. a tragedy, <laughs> yeah. you could have been there. That's the joy. final destination. That's the <laughs> real joy of missing out. I think for me yeah. at least. Yeah. Okay, how about kitten fishing? Yeah. So just what it sounds like. <laughs> fishing for kittens. <laughs> when you're sort of on the lookout for. Younger, non millennials. No, 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 perhaps? no. no, no. Okay. It's it's a lighter version of catfishing. Oh. Oh, is that when you like um neg like you're negative to someone? No, apparently catfishing is when you it's online you you basically fake your oh. online persona to attract somebody. Yeah. And kit kitten fishing fishing is just exaggerating or. Yeah. Yeah. I fake my podcast persona to attract listeners. <laughs> Lit. Lit uh, means it's yeah. good. Yeah. Right, so it's good. It's lit. That's oh. well lit. Oh, well yeah. Not well lit. I mean, this room's well lit. <laughs> this chat room. Uh, quiche? Uh, that's a type of cheese based <laughs> <laughs> um, cake. Savory? No, it's savory, isn't it? Quiche. Oh, is, is, that, is that what it means? If something's ordinary, bland? It's, no, no. It's quiche. Quite the opposite. Yeah. yeah, it's to describe like a very attractive person. Quiche. Oh, that, that person is so quiche. How do you spell in quiche? Not Q-I. Yeah, yeah, I like the food. What's stupid? She's quiche. Doesn't make sense. Where, where's that come from? Give us the etymology. Uh, first coined by satirist 
Chris Lilly on his 2013 BBC3 series? If you must know. I mean... Are you on Know Your Me or <laughs> This is a good one for you, Matt. Oh. Um friend. Um friend. Um friend. Um friend. Why is that a good one for me? Because you say um at the beginning of uh, most segments oh, of this do podcast. I? Yeah. Actually, you're an okay so friend. <laughs> yeah, um, friend. So, yeah, but how would you use that in a sentence? Oh, he's an um, friend. Hi, everyone. This is Anastasia. She's my um, friend. Oh, uh, right. Yeah. I, 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 that, the, a lot of these aren't going to stick around, I think. These no. are flash, flashes in the pan. Yeah. With daily the, the, ones, the ones they pick for uh, entry in the dictionary, those will go first. Yeah. yeah. Here we go. Zennials. Oh, is that the new generation? No, that's the one before. That's between millennials and gen. So that's what I am. I'm a zenial. When does okay. the zenial end? Well, they say eighty five. They ah, say seventy seven so to eighty five. So you're eighty five. So we're we're zenials. No, no, I told you we're not 86. millennials. Eighty five, eighty seven to eighty five. Seventy seven to eighty five. Yeah, uh, eighty six right. is after eighty five. <laughs> I thought we were counting back eighty seven to eighty five. <laughs> hey, two years, but we're okay. Yeah. No, we're not. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, I, again, this is another topic we've discussed before, but uh, would you ever use, you know, authentic texts or realia that include uh, some of this vocabulary to intru- with the purpose of introducing it to your students or making more of these types of terms? If they were going to go and study in the UK, uh-huh. maybe. Okay. Like, I, I'd say, you know, here's some vocab you might hear from complete morons in the streets. <laughs> but, okay. but, you know... What about a term like woke? Oh yeah, no. Obviously, I'm being hyperbolic. <laughs> there is, I, I think, some of those words could be useful, but you know, they're not going to be useful for like a, you know, necessarily for a sixty year old businessman who's going to go and do business in Taiwan or something. Mm. So it depends very much on the students that you're uh, you're sending off and where they're going. Like, mm. know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's not the kind of thing I do at the moment. Yeah. That kind of teaching. So yeah. No. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what, what about you? Um, so you, you, um, we should, well, you, people probably already know, but you, you have a hand in updating or editing a textbook. Mm. Would you ever put these words into the textbook? I have added on a, on a, a topic, uh, a unit on, you know, online communication. Mm-hmm. I included some examples of online, you know, IRL and LOL and those kinds of things. Right, 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 right. Not necessarily with the purpose of... They're kind of out of date as well. Yeah. yeah. So that's, the, that's another thing with this. They, these kind of come and go, I think. Yeah. I think some of them will stick. Yeah. I think YOLO yeah. might stick. Really? <laughs> yeah. You still hear it? Yeah. Really? Okay. Yeah. What, in, mean, in like, spoken... I'm still catching up on the internet from 2013, yeah. but... <laughs> I'll get to 2018 eventually. It's a lot to see. It's a lot of internet out there, you know. Yeah. Yeah. You have to start somewhere. Yeah. 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 I, I, mean, I, haven't, I haven't been in every chat room yet. I'm still <laughs> going around the rooms. <laughs> right. Yeah. That is probably the biggest danger. Is, you know, you you do want to make students aware, depending on the context in which they're going to be using English. You want to make them aware of high frequency terms. Yeah. But it's, it, like you say, it's so hard to know which ones will still be relevant. So. Yeah. And the thing is, if they, I mean, part of the joy, I think, of going, if they, if they are going to go and study in the UK or something, mm. part of the joy is, is discovering all these words. You know, yeah. like, someone like us, you know, standing at the front going, hey, <laughs> YOLO, this is an important word for the youth of today. You know, you want, you want to go and learn it from your friends. Mm-hmm. It's part of the fun. And, and that's, you, you find, don't you, that students who do go and study abroad, like, they take such a great joy in learning all these words, and they come and ask you. Mm. You know, do you know this word? Have you heard this word? Yeah. yeah. And uh, you say no. So I'm an old. I imagine, like the the minute a teacher uses one of those words in a classroom, that's that's when the kids will stop using it. <laughs> yeah. So. yeah. 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 Did the Daily Mail sell it? Was good or bad? Um, there's probably a hint of you know what are these crazy kids up to. <laughs> um, but it was just you know get to know your snowflakes basically. All right. Was it like um how to know if your kid is talking about Satan on the <laughs> Probably. Yeah. What YOLO. Uh, I can't think of that. Jomo. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, anyway, that was this episode's TEFL News. Fake news. Thank you very much for listening. If you'd like to get in contact with us, you can send an email to teflology at gmail.com. You can follow us on Twitter at teflology. Uh, you can like our Facebook page, which is uh, just Tefology Podcast. Um, or you can go to our website, which is teflology podcastcom 
Uh, the podcast is now available on a variety of different services, including Spotify uh, and YouTube and and SoundCloud. Um, so there's a, a variety of ways for you to listen. Um, and we've also got a really good book, so buy it. Uh, so it's goodbye from me. Goodbye from me. Goodbye. Goodbye.